Good afternoon. I'll let a few folks trickle in from the uh, snack time out there. But um, I am so glad to be here. I finally got in uh, from the airport after some crazy travel delays. But I'm super excited to talk to you today about connecting data architectures. Um, and today I hope to convince you that it's OK to have a complex data architecture as long as we described and define the right abstractions within the level of our data. Uh, my name is Chet Mancini, and I am a data engineer at Intent Media in New York City. Um, I work on large information systems and machine learning, and uh, I've been thinking a lot about uh, the growth of big data and information systems over the last few years. And I'd like to improve our mental model about how we think about connectivity uh, and engineering when we're talking about polyglot systems exchanging data with, with each other. Um, so the talk's going to be in three parts. Uh, I'm going to talk about the vision for why we want to connect uh, different pieces together into larger systems. And then uh, we'll look at some tools, specifically with regard to data, uh, schema, and format, on how we can communicate better. And then uh, we'll talk about some war stories. And you can learn how to use me as a negative example about what not to do when you build systems. Uh, so uh, let's see. So why do we want to be thinking about connecting large systems together. Well, uh, I'm sure many of you are actually already working on polyglot type systems. Even if you have a small product app, you maybe have um, uh, an iPhone, Android app, uh, backend server, and uh, some kind of API. Uh, and you're, you're wiring all that together. Maybe you're talking to a database. Um, but it easily gets bigger than that. Um, maybe you're working on a microservices architecture. and all of a sudden, you need to be deploying separate components that are talking to each other, and each one might be developed in a separate language. Um, maybe you're working, like I do, on a machine learning data pipeline, where you have kind of data coming in, and it has to be munged, and then there's some kind of feature extraction, and then you've got to learn a model, and then you publish that model. And, uh, and it, you know, this is getting bigger and bigger. Uh, people are adding machine learning components, and those, th those pipelines are getting bigger and bigger. Um, I want to give a personal anecdote uh, about some hardcore engineering I was doing back in the early 90s. Um, maybe, you, uh, maybe you recognize these sets, um, uh, but uh, I, I first thought about how we connect systems together back when I was um, building this, this great stuff. You know, these are vintage Legos. Perhaps you, perhaps you have these same sets. This is my favorite. Um, but uh, I'm still a bit of a nerd, and I go to museums a lot. And in, in New York, um, I ran across this, uh, this museum called the Cooper Hewitt Museum. And in that, they have these sort of quartz artifacts. And this display really struck me. Um, and I want you to sort of like enjoy how awesome this toy set is. Um, you notice along the top uh, of this matrix are all the toy systems you remember as a kid. Or maybe you still have. That's OK, too. Um, and, then, and then going down the side it, uh, are, um, are those same toy systems. And within the matrix um, are adapters between each of those systems. Um, I actually made some of these. And they're passing them around right now. And so uh, enjoy those. Uh, feel them out um, uh, and uh, pass, them, pass them around. Um, uh, it, they're actually 3D printed. Um, and so it's called the Free Universal Construction Kit. And I've been having trouble thinking of a good acronym for that. But, uh, but maybe you can imagine a good one. Um, so, uh, but, uh, but it's free because it, they're actually a downloadable uh, blueprint. You can download these files and then 3D print them with your home 3D printer. Maybe, maybe you'll have one someday. Um, but uh, it's, it's pretty cool. And, but think of this as, uh, as engineers. What is, what is this doing? Well, for each toy system, it's abstracting the other systems, the details of whether uh, the other system is a Tinker Toy or a Lincoln Log or a Lego. And um, what they've developed is something that has several advantages. It's easy to use. Each toy only sees itself. To each piece of Lego, all it sees is Legos. It's easy to extend. 
when the next big toy manufacturer wants to make a new toy, um, all we need to do is define new adapters, and we can work with, our, um, with, with everything we already have. And they can all play together, pun intended. It's also easy to generate. Because these are 3D printed, uh, if you get more toys, all you have to do is print more. Um, and uh, we can continue to just kind of add, add new ones as we need to go along. Um, they, they, they generate themselves. So yeah, that's uh, when you put it all together. It's pretty cool. Um, so object-oriented programming actually kind of works the same way when we're piecing together and building abstractions, um, actually from the very beginning. And um, the idea is that we have these different components interacting with messages. And I think the same paradigms need to apply when we're building larger objects, which are actually applications or processes, and they need to communicate with other applications or processes. And it's important at that scale that we think about the nature of the message, the structure of the message, and the format of the message perhaps more than who's actually sending it. Um, OK. So I'm going to talk now about a couple uh, tools that we can use to build uh, abstractions into our data. And uh, the first is choosing the right format. So choosing the right format is what's going to make our connections between our systems easy to extend. The goal is to find a format that is not particular to a specific language ecosystem, but rather one that is more generic. And uh, this seems obvious, but it's sort of not, especially to, um, to an early engineer. Uh, I, I, I once was working in a class project, and we all wanted to exchange data structures. So of course, I pulled out my Java and used Java Serializer, and someone else pulled out their Python and started pickling data structures. And all of a sudden, we had no way to talk to each other, no way to exchange information. So try to avoid the built-in libraries, the built-in uh, systems, even if they kind of work well with your ecosystems, with something that's generic. So CSV, um, tab separated values, really great. Work, really work with everything, work on Unix, um, it's awesome. JSON's pretty good, has some disadvantages. Uh, and then, God forbid, you're using XML, but maybe that's, uh, maybe that's your choice. Um, so uh, we need to talk a little bit about JSON. Uh, JSON's super popular, and why is that? Well, it's kind of like Lego in the sense that once you start getting big and the web got really, really big, uh, when everything can just talk to the web out of the box, we have no problem. So it's kind of like uh, we're, we don't have, need, need to build an adapter if we're building web applications because we can just communicate with JavaScript. Of course, uh, you get the downsides that there's not actually useful types and uh, that it's not super performant. Um, but there are solutions. And so um, I want to actually show you a format that I think is really cool. Um, and maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't, but uh, Cognitech, the uh, Clojure folks, made this amazing format called Transit. Now, Transit is both a format, but also a set of libraries and uh, elements and extensions for representing typed values within your application. It's encoded as valid JSON or message pack, and it self-describes. Um, so you don't need to have external schemas, and you don't need, an especially, um, l just convention within your company. It has a bunch of standard libraries that work out of the box. And I would love to give you a quick demo of Transit. So let's pop over. Uh, let's see. Open up the REPL. OK. And uh, I'll just do a quick kind of simple demo, show you how this works communicating typed values between Java or Clojure and Python, which is pretty awesome. So uh, I'm going to just require uh, let's get this in there. OK. Now, uh, I defined a function called write object, which is going to write an object. So let's define an object. Let's see, let's call it Midwest. And oh, good, that's nice and big. Uh, let's give it a name. And we'll call it, oops, um, Midwest. OK. 
and we'll give it a, um, well, the nice thing about, uh, it, we, 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 you can kind of assume how the, uh, how the primitives work, but I'll show you some more complex types. So um, let's say we want to specify a URL. Uh, well, we can specify that really easy. And uh, that's actually a real uh, URI type that we're putting into our data structure. Uh, let's look at uh, UUID. And just, just for fun, they have support for UUIDs. Called ID. And just generate a random one here. OK. And close that. OK, so now we have an object called Midwest. I'll show you what that looks like. That's what we defined, uh, URI and UUID. Now, uh, I'm going to write that out now to a file. OK. And I'm going to slurp in the file just to get, usually see what it looks like. So we're going to slurp uh, data file. I just defined that. OK, and that's what it looks like un uh, underneath the hood there um, a few times. Uh, so you can see uh, the strings kind of a large, so it looks sort of native. Uh, URIs have a special R marker that we put in front of them. UUIDs have a U. It's all very, co very compressed, but it's a way to kind of define the way we want to write out types. Um, OK. So um, l let's try reading this back in. So we can read it back in, and there's our object. Uh, you can see now we have a URI impl and a um, UID. Uh, and I can actually um, just, just call useful functions on this now. So we'll call get most significant bits on the ID of my uh, object. So, uh, so I can exchange type values uh, about while serializing it to real JSON. Now, uh, I'm going to show you what this looks like in Python. I can do the same thing. So uh, let's just, uh, I'll show you my file here. It's very, very simple, almost absurdly simple. Um, and I'm basically just going to set up a reader, and I'm going to pull in my file and, and print it out. And so the nice thing is um, it's going to be native Python types for each of those. Um, and so now I have a real Python object. So pretty cool. Uh, uh, I encourage you to look more at Transit. There's a ton of amazing features. And I think it could be really useful for being careful about how we exchange, um, exchange values in our applications. OK. Now it's time to talk about schema. Um, so if you aren't using something like Transit, you probably need to be defining some sort of a schema for your data so that you ensure type safety. Um, let's, I'm going to wait on that for a second. Um, and the goal with a schema is uh, that we want to be able to enforce our types on either end of the application logic so we don't sort of get confused in the transmission. And we can do this on both an in, in sort of an internal way, but also an external way. So internally, you probably have uh, object types like, um, I don't know, like Active Record has these, you, know, you can define these model objects, right? Those, those are sort of ways internal to your application that you're talking about your data. Um, but maybe more usefully, when we sort of take a step back from our whole application and think about components talking together, we need to find a way to do it externally. So we can define a external schema in a number of ways. Uh, we usually call that a, um, an IDL, or interface description language. And then we can version that and deploy it to, to our application. And so the prototypical example of this is protocol buffers, where uh, the project out of Google, where you define a, a protobuf file, which is a struct of your types, and then you and then you put that in your build chain, and that will develop 
uh, objects that you can use in your applications, and then they can talk in binary to each other, which is awesome. Um, the problem is it doesn't actually give you that much abstraction because the implementation that I am using protobuf is uh, sort of leaks through, right? So you have to enforce it at your whole at your whole level, or else um, everything needs to be using protobufs. It's it's kind of hard to to move between that. There are ways to build flexible uh, external schemas, and one way that uh, I've been using recently is called uh, is using Avro. Now Avro is a, a Apache project, and you define a uh, you define this IDL as sort of JSON that describes what you want your data to look like. And then you can send that to either end of your application. Now, that can be either a build step where it generates you Java classes or something like that to interact with your data, or you can read in the schema at runtime and, and actually sort of create this dynamically validated data processor. Um, and so you have both a sort of static and a dynamic choices, but you still get the constraints of passing around one schema file to your entire application or your entire like, system of applications. There are a few problems, though. Um, Avro doesn't work with everything. And so sometimes it's fun to uh, use new languages. And I write using a lot of closure. And there's a way in closure that's idiomatic to describe data called schema. And that's an uppercase schema from the folks at the um, awesome company Prismatic. And uh, you should check that out. But schema is pretty simple in the sense that you can just define a data structure that uh, in your application it's just a map of uh, keys and values, the keys being symbols and the values being um, uh, types, like integer, float. Um, and so what I wanted to be able to do was to move, is to send this sort of Avro schema that's defining my data over my entire system and then get that as a business object that I have within my, um, that I have within my closure app. And so uh, I, along with my colleague, wrote a schema transform. And it will take an Avro file and transform it into a data structure and vice versa, take a data structure and turn it into an Avro file if that's what you really want to do. Uh, so that way you can share your schema around. Uh, it maintains all the ma major primitive types and also supports uh, complex types. And you can have optional required fields. And I would love to give you a demo of that. OK. Let's see here. OK, so we're going to require the uh, prismatic schema. OK. And then my basically um, defining a way to turn Avro into a prismatic schema. And then similarly, let's, uh, we'll show you the other direction too. And that one actually, I'm not sure why it's called that, but it's called to Avro. OK. Now, let's see. Let me give you some pretty printing. So uh, let's define an Avro schema. I'll, I have one prepared. Uh, this one is a way to uh, show, uh, to, to, do, to have orders. And the, you have like an order, has a customer, has an order detail. So it gets pretty complicated. And this is the way Avro describes how I want to be able to send orders or order information between my system. And so you can see there's a lot of sort of interesting fields here. It has some documentation. It has an enum with uh, available values. Um, it has uh, a map of properties. So we have a lot of different types that we want to be able to specify. And so I'm going to grab that. This is, a, this is a compressed version of that. And we'll call this uh, Avro Schema. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, there we go. And then I so I have so this is maybe what I would check into my repository as I throw it around my system. Now I want to be able to turn this into business logic within my app. And so uh, I I want to use my transformer and I'll, I'll call uh, Avro to Prismatic. Uh, Okay, and that's that's a data structure of my schema. Now uh, we can also go the opposite direction. So let's say I want to define a schema in my data structure. So uh, I want a desk schema, and that's going to we'll call it uh, Midwest. And again, we can give it a name. Actually, sorry, it'll be a string. And okay. And uh, now I want to turn this into an Avro file to be able to share with other applications. So I'll call to Avro. And I can even namespace it. And then out comes my, uh, with a raw string that I can, which is basically a valid Avro uh, uh, schema. So the, uh, why is this cool? <laughs> well, the, 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 the benefit is not, uh, is, is that I can be able to define the schema that enforces uh, and, and describes the data that I pass around my system, but then I can use it in ways that are flexible to my own applications, my own languages. Um, and of course, what you should take away from this is not, I need to go out and download Schema Transform. It's, I need to think about, do I need the appropriate transformer for my application? And so depending on what your language is, it doesn't have to be closure, it can be whatever, um, you need to be defining the right adapters and the right abstraction that lets you share a schema around in your application. And I, I think a lot of people might shy away from this because um, it does, it, you have to sort of add this other thing. But I think it gets to the idea that if you add, sometimes adding a component like a transformer uh, might actually allow us to be more flexible in the way we describe our communications. OK. So. Let's go to some stories. Um, so first, are you, uh, are you describing the types of your data? Um, it, it's describing a, being, being firm about your types uh, in, in a way that some languages like JavaScript might actually not, not give you can be dangerous. And so for example, um, like, even with primitives, it's kind of important to be able to know what type we're passing around, whether it's a float or a decimal or a ratio or whatever. Uh, and so you know, maybe you've seen something like this before. We've all kind of seen uh, if, if I have a value in Python, 2.765, and then I want to say, uh, OK, that looks like what I put in. Great. Well, what if I round it to, uh, to de two decimal places? What's going to come out? Well, of course, it's going to be 2.67. Well, why is that? Uh, why is it truncating when it should be rounding? Well, it, of course, computers don't know how to store just that. They store something much larger in, in IEEE. And so what we actually are getting is, uh, let's look at 60 characters of that. Did I get that right? There we go. That's what it actually looks like. And so I think it's important to have types. And you know, maybe your application doesn't matter uh, whether you're passing around 4.9999999 or you're passing around 5, but it's important to be able to, uh, in, in some applications, know what that actually is. The other really important thing is uh, what if you are moving around, um, uh, moving around uh, uh, complex types like sets? 
wouldn't it be nice not to know that you would have to de deduplicate your data on either side? If you read in an array, it would be nice to know, is the data homogeneous? Is it sorted? Is it, um, is it, um, is it deduplicated? Is it a is it model a set? Um, cool. The other thing to, to kind of gotcha with types is, uh, is nulls. And so um, maybe you've seen something like this in your data before. Uh, but uh, I, I actually had a very a, a production issue that related to not understanding the ways different teams and different applications were sharing null, um, uh, null information around. And so, so the, story, the story goes that I was updating some records in Amazon DynamoDB from some data I was getting. And I, I, the, I, if there was no ID, I would just drop it on the floor. If there was an ID, I would push it up. Well, Dynamo shards its IDs into machines, and so it's not actually so scalable um, within a single ID. Well, on the other side, um, a, a, a change went out where the ID was being sent as ID not found, as a string. Because um, you know you don't want to send empty fields, uh, and of course Dynamo overloads, the queue overloads, and uh, and everything kind of blows up. And the story is not that you know oh you should never send nulls as strings, um, although that does get you in a lot of trouble. But the idea is you want to be able to maintain a null semantic. Um, okay, so are you able to add and remove fields from your schema? Um, can you evolve your adapters without downtime? Um, so I recently had another story here where I had, uh, had some enums in a data model that was shared between uh, multiple applications. And we're serializing data on the front end and reading it on the back end, and that's great. But um, one of the things that was required is this enum, which had a set of values, and the val and it Th those values were required. We had to be one within one of the, in the within that set. So somebody added a new value to the enum, which makes total sense. And our front end deployed before the back end got it. And so the front end is now serializing this new enum value that it of course wants to get. And then the back end chokes because it says not a valid enum. Well, this happens all the time and uh, you know, one way, of course, is to synchronize your whole deploy deployment process for your entire service architecture. But that seems a little impractical. Uh, and, it, and it really highly couples your deployment. Um, the, way to break the, uh, the way to break the connections and allow each thing to move individually without relying on the others is to by just thinking really carefully about what do you require and what do you not require? What is optional? And where, where, do, where will you choke and where will you forgive? So be thinking about that because it, uh, that, that's what's going to allow you to move and swap out um, pieces. Finally, can you extend your schema to the next language of tomorrow? Um, there will always be a new programming language. Um, who knows what will be after Clojure, after um, Elm and all these other great languages we heard about at the last talk. Um, is your spec reasonable enough that you can take advantage of tomorrow's hot new language by writing some kind of transformer or building your own data objects based off this schema? Can you iterate quickly? And can you, um, can you swap out components? Can you swap out languages? Um, cool. So to review, just like the, uh, here we go. Just like the free universal construction kit, uh, is your data architecture easy to use? Um, pick a flexible format and write the parsers and the serializers you need to exchange the data and make your app work. Um, you want to be able to, to be able to plug in new pieces and not really think about the language that they're talking in. Is your data architecture easy to extend? Can you add new fields? Can you get new languages and new types in? Can you refactor your architecture? Or have you tightly coupled the pieces? Is your data system easy to generate? Um, 
wouldn't it be awesome if we could just start passing around a blueprint and next time we wanted to add a field to our applications and our systems, we could just generate everything we needed, all the components that needed to know about it, rather than updating it here and updating it there and moving it down the line. Can you write once and deploy everywhere? Now, the one thing that's not in here is simplicity. Uh, sometimes it takes a little scripting, another adapter, another piece you have to add into your components to build the flexibility into your serialization, your format, and your schema. Data transforming is messy, but sometimes the components you add actually help because they are abstractions. Um, these abstractions are what we are really good at. Um, we have OO already. We have great patterns there about how to connect pieces. And I think we can de begin to start developing patterns in data. There's so many other things I wasn't able to talk about um, and new infrastructures and, and ways that we can kind of break the, the, the communication between processes together that, but still get the reliability. So create your abstractions, solve your problem, iterate, refactor, swap it out, you know, the, you know the drill. Like This is, this is b basic to computer scientists and engineers, um, and I think we can do it with our data as well. Um, yeah, push down the gritty challenges and, uh, and kind of hide it for your applications and, and you know, be willing to, to try something new. I encourage you to um, go build something awesome, and, uh, and thank you very much. How are we doing for questions? We have eight minutes left, so I would love to take questions. Uh, I didn't get to a bunch of things about um, in data, data infrastructure, um, APIs, uh, old formats. I, you saw, maybe saw a slide here, like ASN1. Um, there's all sorts of history here, um, but I would love to talk about it if you guys have any questions. So uh, great talk, uh, thanks. For, uh, so in the Avro world, and part of it, you have to share your schemas with all your consumers. Can you talk about any techniques that or anything that you've done to, to share schemas between readers and writers, or are you doing it in the world? Yeah, yeah. so, um, so what uh, I've done in my company is actually take, a, um, take an Avro file, and then we check that in as a uh, in, in actually a GitHub project, uh, I think we call it like schema or something like that. And then that in its build step will actually generate a uh, generate Java classes. Um, and then we check that in as a, into um, uh, Artifactory actually. And so we have that kind of repository we can just pull from. Uh, and that's all versioned. And so uh, each producer and consumer can just pull from that single repository. Does that answer the question? Sweet. I got it. I got the mic. I got a mic. Question right here. There you go. Awesome. Yep. Um, I wonder if you could just riff on the performance topic. Uh, once you abstract yeah. and you translate and you've got this additional layer, what, um, I don't know, maybe experiences or what would you say on the performance topic? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I think the, the best thing we describe performance is if you need to improve your performance, you'll know about it, and you'll, that's, when you, that's when you say, OK, I need to write, do, do tight coupling. Some of the systems here are actually super performant. There's a, uh, a system called Captain Proto, um, if you've ever heard of it, uh, that actually uses, um, I believe it's called like zero copy. And the advantage is like in C, you can sort of define your data structure, and it literally like, doesn't actually do any transformation. It just writes it out. And so that's incredibly fast, but you get the sort of the strictness of the separate file from like protocol buffers. Um, so you can get really, really fast serialization in some of these, actually more fast than maybe other systems have. Um, but when it comes to adding in a new adapter or a new connection or something, I think, hmm, in my experience, the best value add has always come from making things more flexible to use, not getting that last percentage of performance out. Um, and if 
if you need that last percentage performance out, then you'll know and you'll do that. But for most people, don't need, don't, most people don't need to be told to like, oh, worry about your milliseconds. You need to be thinking about, can the person who comes after this use my tool to deliver real business value? So that's, that's sort of my thought on that. Um, but if you need performance, there's certainly ways to get it. How do things like transit deal with um, inability for some data types to be translated between Java and Python or Java and Ruby or anything like that? Yeah. Um, so it has out-of-the-box support for a lot of types. You get all the const. Um, I, didn't, I wanted to show that because using a real set, you can actually pass around the like a set or a map. It all, it all kind of works. Each And then each adapter library you know, knows what that looks like in its own language. Um, so you get a lot out of the box, but you can also define your own. It has a whole extension protocol, and you can um, say, I want to define a new character, and that new character is going to represent some new thing. Um, yeah, uh, check it out. I haven't actually done a lot with defining my own types. The, the built-in types have kind of served my purposes so far. Anything else? Okay. Um, yeah, have fun piecing together systems. <laughs>